Hello, and welcome to a special panel discussion about the impact and legacy of immigrants from Ireland and across the British Isles, presented by Albany Premusica. This discussion accompanies our visual concert, Celtic Dreams, How Can I Keep From Singing, which is available to stream on our website. I am Jose Daniel Flores Caravaggio, the Opaca Family Artistic Director, and we are honored to have today a distinguished panel moderated by our own Rex Smith. Enjoy. Well, welcome folks. Thanks for joining us for this enlightening conversation about the Celtic influence, probably more specific of the Irish American influence in our community and our country. Uh, I'm Rex Smith from the Albany for Music Board of Directors. I'm very happy to be your host with this. Um, our guests uh, will talk a little bit more about very shortly. Let me just introduce first Dr. Elizabeth Stack, the Executive Director since 2018 of the Irish American Heritage Museum in Albany, um, a, a native of County Kerry, by the way. Uh, Jennifer Crowley, a lecturer and doctoral candidate in cultural anthropology at the University of Albany. Um, and Jack McEnany, for 20 years, uh, Jack represented Albany County in the New York State Assembly. He's the author of Books of Local History, and he'll tell us about his uh, Irish heritage in this community. Uh, and by the way, I have a cousin who I uh, recently uh, have heard from uh, suggesting that uh, our Scott Irish roots uh, date back to 17th century immigrants. Uh, so I'm one of you folks, uh, mm -hmm. uh, proud to uh, claim my heritage as well, even though I belatedly have discovered it. Um, so in any case, to our audience, uh, the notion is that you know, almost one in 10 Americans, 36 million people claim Irish ancestry uh, from all 32 Irish counties. Um, and now, you know, there are only 7 million people on the island of Ireland. Uh, so in a sense, uh, this is perhaps a more Irish country than that. But in any case, the impact has been significant. Just to begin, uh, let's ask our panelists to tell us a little bit about where they and their people came from. Um, why don't we start with you, Elizabeth, because, because we love to listen to you first. Why, why, by the way, do people love the Irish uh, brogue so much? What, what is it, you think? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, it's very interesting, I think, the, the accent. Very difficult to replicate, apparently, if, if the kerfuffle over the film over the summer. Um, <laughs> I can't remember who was in it, but, you know, the accents did not sound good. Um, so, yeah, I'm from Listowel in County Kerry, which is um, a heritage town, it's called in Ireland. Um, so we have a castle dating, you know, we were the last castle to fall to Queen Elizabeth I's forces in 1603. And an ancestor of mine apparently defended the castle and was hanged in the courtyard the day after. Um, you know, we are very conscious, I think, in my hometown, we have a writer's festival and a horse racing festival. So education and culture is important and history, of course. So I went to university in Dublin and then in Cork and then over here in New York and I taught at Fordham University for uh, about nine or eight years and then I moved up here as you said in 2018 to take over the museum so you know slightly different focus still public education I guess but I'm out of the classroom and of course my own work had been on Irish immigrants at the turn of the 20th century and how they coped with immigration reform and restriction coming into the Johnson Reed Act. So um, the the tone, I think it's just our accent is so soft that we could be saying anything and you, you know, maybe you're not listening to the content as such. <laughs> it's just listening to the voice. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think uh, that's my own story. You know, I have an aunt who left Ireland in the 60s in North Dakota. My grandfather's brother left Ireland in the 20s or 30s and went to um, Seattle, Washington. My other side, you know, we have people um, that came into Michigan out of Canada. So we are a family of immigrants as well, even though I'm the most right. And of course, I have a sister in California. So. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this, uh, you definitely have the credentials. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jennifer Crowley from UAlbany, tell us your story. Well, I'm a cultural anthropologist, as you said, out of the Department of Anthropology at UAlbany. Uh, I've been teaching there as a lecturer for the past 10 years, and my most frequent courses that I offer tend to be in Irish and Irish American uh, kind of ethnology, also my most popular draws, big surprise there. Um, I'm also a researcher in Northern Ireland, where I work in Derry, Northern Ireland. Um, I'm looking at uh, kind of post-conflict heritage and tourism development. I was living there for about four or five years prior to the pandemic, which brought me back to the States for a wee bit. 
while we wait for the jab and we can get back there hopefully in the summer. Um, but in the meantime, I'm glad it brought me back here because I get to join all of you today. So well, wonderful. wonderful. My own family. Um, well, we are from all four provinces on all four branches. We've kind of spread out around the island. Um, we all came over either through Canada or into the port of Boston um, and then settled in the Boston area, uh, predominantly the whole family, all four branches uh, in and around the Boston area. And then I myself grew up on the South Shore in the so-called Irish Riviera in uh, Marshfield, Massachusetts, where a lot of my family still hails from. Uh huh. Okay. The South Shore to people around here seems like um, Long Beach, New York, but yeah. uh, that's a different, <laughs> uh, different South Shore. How about that? Jack McEnany, uh, you, your uh, family has been here a long time. Well, yeah, I think every one of the eight great-grandparents lived and died in Albany, New York. They're all wow. buried in the same cemetery. Everybody got here between 1825, back in the days when they were attracted by the, the railroad and the Erie Canal and things supporting it. And the other half of them came for the famine. So. Uh, They've come from all over Ireland, eight, uh, eight different counties that I can identify with and all pretty well clustered either in Ulster or in the Midlands. And, uh, you know, I, I was a good, good friend with Dick Connors. He was my predecessor in the, uh, uh, in the state legislature in the assembly. And he was contacted uh, by an individual who wanted to do a study of the Irish in the Albany area. And his name was Reginald Byron. He's passed fairly recently. In fact, he's buried here because he had family uh, here in Albany. And he was a professor at that time at the Queen's University in Belfast. And the British government at that time was, were sending kids out all over uh, doing uh, work that would be in the summer and also year round graduate students could be there. And the two graduate students lived at Dick Connor's house. And the question is, why did you go to the Albany area? Because Albany is the one that has Albany history from colonial times. It has uh, the Erie Canal generation. It has the famine generation. It has people that came during the land problems in the 1880s. And it has people coming throughout the uh, uh, 19th century and then the 20th century. And the thing is that he was into uh, we'd call it sociology, and they called it, I think, uh, uh, anthropology, which gets misleading the way we look at it. And <laughs> we wanted to know what the different generations were. How did they identify themselves as being Irish? How did they get along with other groups? And that makes Albany, I'm a former county historian as well, and wrote the history book on Albany City. And uh, that's a fascinating thing, because when we celebrate this Irishness, which is so unique to our capital region, you have all different opinions uh, and it shows up. Their attitudes on uh, current events, their attitudes on the church, their attitude on other ethnic groups, unions, etc., makes it a fascinating place to study. The book was written, by the way, and it's available. Fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm intrigued by this notion that eight great grandparents all buried in the same cemetery, but did you say they are from eight different counties, yet they all- Yeah, one, one's yeah. cheating because it's on both sides of the river and there's two counties. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, most of them uh, didn't like the people where they were apparently because they never married anybody from the same, from the same county. Amazing. Uh, I, I should tell a story too, but uh, uh, I obviously go to St. Agnes Cemetery and visit throughout the, throughout the year. And at one point, of course, I'm up to my neck in, in politics and I'm up wandering through the older section and somebody comes along, it wasn't Memorial Day, he said, Jack, what, what are you doing here? And I turned, I looked at them, I said, oh, uh, voter registration. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the look would be like, I knew it, I knew it all. And then all of a sudden a smile will hesitantly show up on the face. <laughs> this is uh, actually uh, the, the wonderful uh, Albany novelist William Kennedy does this in his novel, Roscoe. Uh, he has an Albany politician saying, uh, what do we do with the people who've died since the last election? And the answer is, vote them. 
Uh, he also <laughs> says they were all Democrats anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, so my wife loved that so much that she turned that into her license plate, which is Bodum. Uh, <laughs> wonderful little motto for uh, American politics. So, but this notion of, uh, is that a, um, is that just, was that just self-preservation? Um, Elizabeth, would you maybe tell us just a sense about this? The, the, the notion that the Irish, though, from different places uh, in Ireland uh, banded together and stayed together here. Is, is that, I guess that's probably typical of every immigrant group, though, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I suppose in one sense, it almost wasn't inevitable. You know, as Jack says, people were very conscious of where they came from themselves at home. So, you know, initially, when you came to America, you were from Kerry or from Cork, and there was not particularly, you know, in the early 19th century, uh, or, or even, you know, the 1800s, despite a growing nationalist movement at home, there wasn't a sort of cohesive Irish identity. Um, what really, I guess, happens here is that it separates the Catholics from the Protestants in one sense, you know, so this Scotch Irish term, for instance, is kind of invented at the time, you know, to differentiate because there's huge anti Catholic discrimination in the 1830s and 40s and 50s with the know nothings and nativist movement. So, over particularly at that time period, the Irish do start to come together. Um, you know, they were quite exposed to politics at home in the early 1800s through Daniel O'Connell used to organize these mass meetings, you know, after mass, there was collections and things, um, boycotts had happened of landlords and things. So there was a kind of an awareness of getting together in numbers helped you. Um, and then this was sort of taken advantage of by Tammany Hall, for instance, in New York City, which was led at the time by a Scottish uh, immigrant, um, well, descendant, Boss Tweed, you know, he's no Irish in him, um, but realized we can realize harness that. Yeah, I know everyone, we always get the blame. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone, I think he understood that we can harness this immigrant group. So it was kind of a dual moment that, you know, Irish people did kind of band together in these networks. You know, you could kind of go to the pub owner for a job or maybe your ward leader. And it was a natural step, I think, into local politics, which then became city politics, which eventually became state and national. So, you know, in that sense, uh, Jennifer, maybe you want to speak to this, then the... Um, those political organizations were, in effect, social service agencies. Oh, uh, absolutely. Is that correct? And, yeah. and even before you kind of had that organization of, of Tammany Hall and things like that, as, as immigrants were coming into these kinds of neighborhoods and these urban places where, I mean, really, we, we also have to recognize we're, we're talking mostly kind of about the famine immigrants that were coming in, you know, from 1845 to 1855. And that extended that kind of Irish Catholic mass immigration into the 1880s and a little bit later. And so they're coming out of, you know, these rural areas of, of, of Ireland where they, you know, coming into an urban kind of uh, setting like Boston or New York or Philly is completely alien to them. So in these neighborhoods that they were settling in, even before we had kind of the boss tweeds and, and these politicos within the Democratic Party, uh, you had your merchant class, you had shop owners and tavern keepers, saloon keepers within the neighborhood. And in addition to the actual immigrants who had come over previously that were helping with migrant chains and, and were there as anchors for people who came into the community, it was really these kinds of almost upper working class, middle class um, previous immigrants that were already established in the cities that facilitated some of these and getting the jobs and, and finding you work and finding you community. The church played a, a great role in this as well, too. And then as Elizabeth was talking about Tammany Hall as well, too. Um, you know, when you, you bring people in, when you want to get votes, what do you do to get votes? You jobs. So they gave them jobs. And, and so we see things like all of a sudden, you see a lot of uh, Irish immigrants on the uh, police forces and, and things like that and, and these different kind of services that are developing within the cities. But initially it was very much within the neighborhoods and it was immigrants helping immigrants, as we see today and have sense with other immigrant groups that have come into the United States and into urban areas, as you see across the world as well, too. So, Jack, you've written about the O'Connell organization, the Democratic machine that uh, ran Albany uh, starting in 1920, I believe. Um, well, we we're uh, celebrating a hundred years for the uh, for the takeover of the city government, at least the election year. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. well, but, but probably not everybody is celebrating, but certainly I. Understand <laughs> uh, but that well, is, I, I knew Dan O'Connell and and uh, yeah, spoke to him and asked him what village in Ireland his people came from, and so on and so forth, which nobody else bothered to ask him. Huh. But you know, people tend to think of the Albany Democratic Machine as a. Uh, well, they think of any political machine in the context of corruption. But I wonder if you might, is it more appropriate to put a, a more benign 
uh, interpretation of what was going on with the political organization. Uh, it's, it's true of all things and of all people. There's a good side and there's a bad side. But if, you're, uh, if you have no heat, you could be in Texas, for example, if you had no heat, the person who comes with the coal is critical. When you're a widow uh, and you get a job for your teenager, that's survival. You don't get over that. And uh, an awful lot of uh, social work was done. I know individual, I remember Mayor Corning bringing a turkey over to somebody's house uh, when, the, when the, uh, uh, the woman died and the kids were there alone. And you know, this kind of things were, was accepted. And if you weren't in that as a ward leader, then you were not going to be kept as a ward leader. It's absolutely mandatory. Mm -hmm. And so it was doing good while doing good for the people while doing good for the party. I guess that is a definition of political good, success in any case, isn't it? Good government is good politics and good politics is, is success. So uh, you can only go so far before people throw you out and you have to change. And certainly whatever went on in 1921 is not going to be the same thing because uh, today we have a lot of these services are done. It's the last, it's the last line or the last pages of, of the uh, Edwin O'Connor's "The Last Hurrah." You know, how did he lose after all those years? And uh, this award leader of somewhat independent said Roosevelt did it. <laughs> and you know, civil service created jobs and, right. and social services were created and so on and so forth. So the need for that, which was quite critical in the 19th century and even the early 20th century, uh, people didn't accept that anymore. It was not acceptable. At one point, it was salvation. The Roosevelt's, well, you know, the Dutch were always sticklers, weren't they? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, speaking of, of Albany history, um, you know, the uh, there has been there have been so many elements of of the Irish impact in America, the Irish immigrants who came to this country, um, and I wonder if you might think about a predominant impact that these that the uh, Irish influx into this country uh, has had. Uh, on what we uh, on the history of America, on the culture of America. Um, so, um, Elizabeth, you've probably spent the least amount of time in this country from your uh, observation, nearly a decade or something, right? From your time here, what do you think has been the most significant uh, impact of uh, this huge influx of Irish people to the United States? Mm. Um. I mean, I suppose we've kind of touched on the, the political aspect, I think, already in, in terms of how important it is, or certainly used to be, um, you know, to have grassroots and, and your street and your ward and your district involved. I do think one of the changes that I'd like to see talked about a little bit more, you know, is their impact on uh, labor, to be honest. Um, and obviously, we'll discuss culture later on, too, with, given our program today. But, you know, a lot of the early um, unions, you know, uh, the pushback against kind of the, the conditions in, in mining or in uh, building canals and, and railroads and things was, you know, Irish. And so the Irish impact on, on union building, um, but even just, you know, arguing kind of for better conditions. And this was not without its problems, you know, a lot of the time, certainly, you know, some of the institutions didn't allow, for instance, you know, people of color to become members or women, but Terence Powderly, Mother Jones, you know, argued very vociferously um, in the 19th century for workers' rights. And what's interesting about somebody like Mother Jones is she was so single-minded, you know, so suffrage, for instance, didn't interest her because she just was talking about working conditions, you know, did huge work for um, child labor, for instance, you know, um, was an excellent orator, the most dangerous woman in America, apparently at one point, you know, just because she could rally these children who had been maimed in factories, you know, and walked to, um, you know, to the president's kind of house and sat on his lawn, you know. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, that, I think that, you know, whether it had long lasting impact on, on legislation or not is arguable at times, you know, and certainly there were mistakes made. But, you know, you have somebody like Quill, even in New York into the 20th century, you know, who's deeply deeply motivated by conditions for his um workers and i mean this was a man who invited martin luther king to speak um mm -hmm. 
at, you know, at one of the labor federations when one of the Southern chapters were trying to keep black people out of union membership. So, um, hmm. you know, he, there, there's an interesting, I think, story about Irish and labor in America. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, what, what aspect of impact on America would you select to, to think, uh, to sort of refresh our thinking about in terms of the Irish uh, community? Well, there's so many to choose from. I would go more with the cultural end, obviously, as a cultural <laughs> anthropologist. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, come, I keep coming back to thinking about identity um, in terms of having an ethnic identity. And that was not something, I mean, we think of it as kind of a, a non-question here in the United States now. Um, you know, we have different ethnic groups that have their different holidays and different kinds of um, emblems and, and traditions and the like. And that wasn't something that you necessarily saw in American society in kind of the high relief you see it now. Uh, there was a great push for assimilation for immigrant groups that were coming in. Um, particularly those that were kind of more other than, than the kind of native born Americans at the time. And we see that with the Irish when they came in, um, there was, because they were so different, because they were Catholic, because they were poor, um, because they were very different from the native Americans, um, there was a lot of kind of um, prejudice against them. Obviously this was deep seated and long rooted back in kind of a lot of discourses coming from England and the like. And there was this transatlantic kind of uh, uh, currency between these, but, as you see the Irish Americans as each uh, kind of immigrant, you know, generation and, and their children and children and their children's children become kind of more a part of American society, you do start to see this expression of cultural identity. As Elizabeth said before, there wasn't really this sense of Irishness back in Ireland um, before mm. the Irish came here. Um, and so we see things like what we're doing this concert for St. Patrick's Day. Most people would be kind of surprised to know that St. Patrick's Day, St. Patrick's Day celebrations and the way that we know them today are very much an Irish American invention. Um, back in Ireland, St. Patrick's Day, it was a feast day, it's a church day. It was like what we would think a uh, comparison in America would be think of Thanksgiving. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of more with a religious bent to it, obviously, but that's kind of that more family communal kind of thing, whereas here it became an expression of community identity. Mm -hmm. um, and as that started to take hold, and as we got into kind of the civil rights movement in the kind of mid 20th century, you start to see other ethnic groups take hold of their ethnic identity as well, too. Uh, you see a lot more of the Italian American associations becoming more prominent and vocal and outward. Uh, they were there, um, but it was more that kind of outward presence. The performance of identity became okay. Um, and so that's one of the kind of big things. And if we look at St. Patrick's Day today and, and some of the kind of Irish American expressions of Irish identity, they've become global. Um, you, you go to Ireland on St. Patrick's Day and there's parades in most every single town. Those were an import that came from the United yeah. States. Uh, that's wonderful. What a concept. No, uh, it's, a well, it's a, it's a well-trod a trodden uh, path that every immigrant group, and if, if you look at one particular group, I mean, it's in March, unfortunately, we see all the activity, but uh, if you look at it, it's a path that many groups have. And wh where you see it today, for example, uh, if, if you go back, nobody would name a kid Bridget, mm -hmm. because Bridget, you wouldn't, if you're Polish, you wouldn't want to be Stosh, because all the jokes were these people. Today, they very proudly named the kid Bridget, which was not that common when I was going to school. African-American names today, what little kids are being uh, named today in the African-American community is something they would not have touched back a generation or two ago because assimilation was thought to be the only way. And then at some point, you have people who take a look at where they are and they say, you know what, I'm proud of what I am and I'm going to uh, stop trying to go into the, uh, to the melting pot. We don't use the melting pot anymore. We think of a stew or a salad where mm -hmm. you can be both things at the same one and be very much part of, part of the same. I think another thing that uh, brought groups together is with the Irish, uh, they were despised by a number of people under the know nothing years. When did it change? When they became heroes during the uh, Civil War. Civil War. And you had to think twice all of a sudden when, when these people are saying that they're keeping this country together. And when the same thing I think happened with people who were worried about Southern and uh, 
uh, Central Europeans coming over here back in the horrible laws that really clamped down on elevate, uh, immigration in the 1920s, for example, and the KKK was high. Italians were not popular. Uh, and yet, if you take a look, and we have Peter D'Alessandro with the Medal of Honor, World War II came, and you know what? Maybe these people are a part of America that matters. And so the evolution uh, of a group that tries to blend in is harsh in the, in the way they're, they're received and hangs up, tries to do the best they can. And then they hit a point where that pride uh, comes in, sometimes at the end of an immigration period. We see it in the names, we see it in the way people look on themselves. Interesting. You know, we, we think about stereotypes which is a term that's often thought of uh, pejoratively, so maybe we should say archetypes, but, but let's think of, of some of those elements that we associate with, with Irish Americans and, and tell me why. I mean, for example, uh, great storytelling, O'Neill, uh, Fitzgerald, William Kennedy, uh, are the Irish in Ireland also great storytellers. Uh, why, how does this happen uh, in America? Elizabeth, you want to start us on that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose technically the Irish are very proud of their, of their storytelling abilities. It was an oral tradition, you know, way back in the Celtic mists, you know, and so, but right up through the Brehan laws and, um, you know, kind of Celtic Norman society, big houses had a bard or a storyteller, you know, a Shanaki, which means old way. And so, you know, these would trace the lineage of the family and, and tell the big stories. And it was even in, you know, my grandparents' time, for sure, um, people traveled around telling stories. You'd kind of beg a night's lodging, you know, and tell a story. And into the 50s and 60s, in small communities, they had what was called Bohan Piat, which is an Irish word, which means going from house to house. And the neighbors would organize, you know, a night of storytelling. Maybe someone's house had a big room so they could do a dance in that house, you know. So that is definitely something that culturally the immigrants brought with them, you know, and I think probably every immigrant culture does tell their story, you know, in, a, in their own, you know, way, but for sure, storytelling and talking uh, is definitely part, I think, of, of the Irish experience in Ireland and, and over here. Hmm. Uh, but, but Jennifer, do you, I mean, other cultures, you're a, a cultural anthropologist, other cultures, uh, had oral histories as well. It's not as though uh, the written word took hold more slowly uh, uh, in the islands. What, 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 how can this be explained? You mean here in America? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, you had, you had these ethnic enclaves, you had people grouping in together. These traditions still stayed very true, but also at the same time as, as we're talking about perceptions and we're talking about prejudice of, is in, you know, prejudicial ideas and conceptions about the Irish, um, you know, it, it, the kind of crux of Irish immigration during the famine years and then after, you had these kinds of negative stereotypes, these anti-Catholic, very poor kind of uneducated stereotypes about the Irish already circulating in the, very prominently in the press, but also on stage. And so they were there and they were being performed. And as you had these immigrants coming in, particularly as they had children. So your first generation of American-born Irish Americans, they themselves started to get, become performers. They became playwrights. They became the songwriters. And so they started to kind of take over some of this narrative. Now, it was a very slow kind of progression in the way that they did, but you do see this happening. Um, and then with the progression also of kind of you know, the attitudes changing, as, as Jack had said, you know, after the Civil War, that was kind of a watershed moment of, of some of these kinds of ideas of the lazy kind of, you know, do nothing Irish really kind of being turned on its head. Um, there's more of a kind of openness for these narratives and these spaces and these stories to be coming. And as we go on, we do, as you said before, the great playwrights, Eugene O'Neill, the great writers, we, we, there's a pathway for them. And, and then they have an audience and they have an audience first amongst other Irish Americans, and then a broader audience there as well, too. Um, can I just actually add to that, too? I think one part of that, particularly as you're saying, it transitions to a writing. 
education, you know, was mm. very important. And uh, the Catholic Church in America, which was mostly Irish controlled, you know, in the 19th century and 20th century, and, you know, operating under fairly repressive kind of, you know, situation because they had to pre more or less make Irish Catholics palatable, you know, that they could be good citizens. So education was free in Catholic schools, you know, and so a lot of, particularly in cities, like poor children who previously would not have been educated were now educated up to a certain degree. And so, you know, women who came in as maids, their daughters were nurses or teachers within a generation. So I think that, and I will say, you know, public education in Ireland was kind of overhauled as well in, in the late 19th century. So there is free education for primary level, at least. So, you know, literacy does spread quite quickly uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century among immigrant groups here because of, of free schooling. And part of that, of course, was a pushback against public school where they were being taught a sort of a Protestant version of religion, even though there was supposed to be separation of church and state, you know, there was a big pushback against reading the Protestant Bible, for instance, you know, but it has that knock on effect of people being educated enough to a produce culture, but be consume culture, you know. And that's, that's another thing that really interesting what Elizabeth says. It's, along with that, it also is you're talking about, you know, immigrant children becoming more kind of educated within the schools. We're also seeing that economic situation change a little bit too, as they're becoming kind of the working classes and the lower middle classes. So what you just said about the consumers of culture, uh, you know, these pejorative ideas of the Irish are more reflective at the time of the audience themselves than, you know, the cartoonist or the writer per se. So as, you know, Irish Americans start to become the audiences. They start to dictate what they want to see. They're not tolerable of these things. They're getting into kind of the working classes and the middle classes. Mm -hmm. They can start to afford theater memberships and these things beyond kind of the vaudeville kind of, you know, little Nickelodeon kind of uh, outlets that you would have in the cities. And so this starts to change the discourse a bit too. Mm -hmm. Well, Jack, look, I think you were, I think you were born in the Truman administration. Uh, growing up in, in America as a, as a... No, no, I'm a war baby. I'm born ah. in 43, so... Ah, okay, you know, okay. Uh, uh, so growing up in America in that era, was there an expectation that you would marry an Irish girl, that you would uh, follow a certain course that would, uh, in effect, preserve the, the purity? Not, not really. Uh, the the group, if they would like it, well, they all want you to marry a uh, Irish Catholic Democrat from Pine Hills. So, you know, <laughs> that, be better. you know nothing is come. But, uh, <laughs> but then reluctantly, you go to people who have different customs, different different food, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the ones that they in this book that I mentioned of the Irish in, in America, poorly titled because you think it's everywhere. It's basically the capital uh, capital region. Uh, the ones that were tolerated the most, if you were going to marry out, first of all, a Catholic. That that would be what you were emphasized in school to marry mm -hmm. a Catholic, and they they would not say another Irishman. But the best was a German. Mm. Why? because the Germans never went home. But if you married an Italian, he'd take your daughter and he'd go back to Italy. And the number of people, what we don't talk about, particularly in the 20th century, we talk about the Irish that never returned, the Jews that never returned, because they had no place to go to. But when you dealt with these later groups, uh, Italians, Greeks especially, Hungarians, it was common for a third of them to go back to the old country because they came for economic reasons. And the idea was I'll go, I'll work hard. Thank heavens the, 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 the streets are filled with gold, paved with gold, and I'm gonna marry somebody and, and I'll move back to the old country. And about the American dream to do that, to come here, make their fortune and go back and uh, you know, if you got back there, you married the prettiest girl and bought the biggest house. But by that <laughs> time, if you're there for a while, you were probably already married and had children. And the fear was that they're going to take your children and your grandchildren away from you. So Germans had the lowest return rate. They also had, like the Irish, are 50-50 male and female in their immigration history. 
sometimes even more, more women. All the others tend to be more, more male. And uh, that means you wind up marrying somebody else. And there was a great fear in the 20th century that they would bring you back, except the Germans who came with many more men than women and they tended not to go back. So they wound up marrying Irish. And most yeah, of the people in my generation, they all have, uh, uh, including my own first cousins, 50-50 Irish and, uh, uh, Irish and uh, German. So two questions arise from that. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, first, I guess uh, for you, why were there so many more women? Why were Irish women uh, immigrating at a higher rate than those of other nationalities. Fewer women uh, who were Germans, Jack was saying, fewer women who are uh, Italian. Why is that? Yeah, it's amazing when you think really, you know, um, to allow a girl, you know, the independence to come on her own without maybe supervision. Now, generally they were coming to either, you know, maybe a priest or some other relative but to be honest, Irish people were so poor, particularly in the 19th century, that you know the oldest child went first. It didn't matter what sex they were, and then he sent out the money for Johnny or the next one in line. And so, you know, the youngest stayed at home uh, and inherited whatever was left, if there was anything to inherit. So my grandfather, you know, was the youngest of 14, the only one that stayed in Ireland. Um, two girls were sent out as nuns to Australia, you know. So, and then the rest of them went to England. Um, so yeah, girls could come and of course maids was, was the job in the 19th century and even into the 20th for these women. So, you know, they're coming in a way to a sort of a structured environment. You know, they're, they're living in, they can save money, they're fed and bound as we say. So the, they're in a position to save money to send it back for the next one or, or to buy a ticket. Um, there was a, a huge movement in the 1850s and 60s of, you know, and later of producing books and pamphlets with advice for these Irish servant girls. So one of the famous ones was written by the nun of Kenmare. And, you know, make sure that you ask for time off for mass, you know, basically how to avoid being raped in the house by the oldest boy or by the master, you know. Um, and so even though it's, they're kind of independent, there is a community around them because there's a network of other maids where they share a lot of information amongst themselves so that they can move up and down in houses for better pay. Um, and of course, the church is always kind of keeping an eye on them. So they're involved in sodalities and, and you know, kind of sorority type organizations. And then you married and you didn't work anymore. Um, so, th and there was no opportunity for women at home, on, you know, particularly poor ones. So some families could get you into the church at home um, or you could ideally marry, you know, that was particularly a problem for women though, because they were often married to men that were much older than them. And this continues into the 20th century, you know, writers like John B. Keane kind of talk about this, that yeah. you have matchmakers, you know, who, who put um, young girls with older farmers, you know, just because there's this dearth of women. Um, and so it was definitely, I think, seen as, an, a, as a positive for a girl to leave home. And in fact, Singh, when he was touring the west of Ireland, met two sisters and one girl was barefoot and, you know, her hair covered with a shawl, couldn't make eye contact with him. And the sister was home from America and had decided to come home with her fortune. And while she was there, you know, really couldn't settle back in. She was um, more outspoken. She had been exposed to the world and she was going to return to America, as Jack said, with a very low return rate. So it's interesting, you know, that this, it does give women freedom uh, even though it was a hard job. Hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, why, uh, one of you, uh, in, when we were talking before uh, we turned on the cameras, made reference to uh, the, uh, when Irish immigrants left Ireland, when, when folks left there to come to America, there were going away parties and they're referred to as wakes, yeah. uh, as the, the way a, a funeral wake would be. Yeah. Uh, why is that? That's time and technology that's changed. The, most of the Irish immigration, like from my family, they would never come back because it took seven to nine weeks to come, come over here. And that's an awful lot of time not to have a job. And then you'd go back and take another. So you're not running back and forth. And so you never saw people when they left. They'd say, I'll be back you knew they wouldn't be back. And so they'd have a going away party and the going away party was called a wake because most people knew this was the last time they would ever see them again. 
And also a lot of them didn't read or write. Some of them, 50% uh, uh, of Ireland was speaking you know, Gaelic at the time of the, of the famine. And they were the ones who, most of them were, uh, were the ones that were lost because of the, their conditions they were in. And uh, the, uh, today, young people, I don't think identify for that. I don't think anybody would say we're going to have a wake uh, because <laughs> Elizabeth is coming over to Albany. <laughs> Because she'll be back. We'll get on a plane. And she come on, it's only going to take her. It wasn't a week. <laughs> it's going to take her a day to get here, and she can stay for a while, and she'll get back on the plane and go back. So yeah. it's something that's disappeared. It's, it's disappeared okay. not only for economic reasons, but also because technology makes it possible to run back. And I've been to Ireland. I've been to the villages, and I'll, I'll bet I've been there eight times. Mm -hmm. All right. I left there. Oh, sorry. I was going to say cultural anthropologist. Uh, tell yeah, us. Well, just uh, a little funny what? story about American wigs. I left Derry uh, about, I don't know, two years ago to come back and, and just file a visa because you have to come back to the States to do it. It's like a giant pain in the neck. But because so many people go over to Ireland and research and they try to make a home and they say, well, I'll be back and they never come back. Um, one of the, uh, the publicans in town, who's a dear friend of mine, threw me an American wig put up signs and all in the pub and everything. And it said, Jennifer's going across the shock. So we're gonna say, you know, goodbye to her. And it was interesting that so many of the younger people in town had no idea what an American wake was. Um, and, and Joe Mohern himself, who was, who was the publican, remembered them from his boyhood, but they were really kind of dying out at that time. And this was kind of from the Donegal area where you were still kind of having some of those traditions. But it was remarkable to me that, you know, hardly anybody under the age of 30 knew what an American wake was. And they were such a kind of intrinsic kind of almost rite of passage for the immigrants at a time, you know, during the kind of you know, mid 19th century. And it has all but died out. It's a, it's a kind of distant memory and now kind of made as a little bit of a joke in a public, you know, pub, you know, pub promotion <laughs> for a going away party. But that would explain, I guess, why uh, we think of, you know, we think of the wonderful heritage of Irish song but some most of the songs seem terribly sad. Uh, you know, even of course in, in America, the uh, prototypical Irish song would be "Danny Boy," uh, and my goodness, if you really listen to the words of that, it just breaks your heart every time. Um, which is why we sing it so often. The fields, the fields of Athen rise is my absolute favorite, and it's a story of. A uh, fellow who's uh, uh, arrested because he stole a rabbit or something like that. So he's going corn. to Australia. What, pardon? Trevelyan's corn. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because the children were starving, right? Yeah. Well, he's going to be going to Australia and so on. And it's a heartbreaking song. Today, the younger generation uses it as a, 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 right, a, a, a fight song for, uh, uh, for football. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they make sure it's all, almost uh, lots of drums and so on and so forth. And, and for somebody who came, for at least half of mine, came more as refugees than as uh, immigrants, that it's, a, it's an awful thing to take that wonderful song that's so sad and turn it into something else. But it's a different generation that is listening to it. You know, Jack, given your years in politics, it, it does seem almost as though Irish immigrants and descendants are so ideally suited for uh, American style politics. Uh, the um, the networking of, of the of the uh, immigrants and their descendants and the storytelling aspects and uh, isn't that right? Uh, the, the, that must be why it is that there is such a strong Irish connection to American politics, right? I think so. It's also a very verbal culture. Uh, even before you could uh, read and write, you know, you people people were listened to for their stories. They were listened to uh, uh, the pub. Uh, the pub keeper was very popular because the pub was not a saloon; it was a community center in the village. And everybody said, "There's still pubs in Ireland." You see little kids going in, so on. It's a, it's a place where you can visit, and uh, the union. You need somebody who can talk to the. Uh, uh, to the workers and politics are the same thing. Those verbal skills are heralded. Mm -hmm. What about law enforcement? Um, Elizabeth, how did it happen that mm, so many uh, cops in America uh, still are? 
uh, Irish, uh, or yeah. and they certainly were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, uh, you know, Jennifer probably touched on this a little bit earlier on, but it's definitely true it came out of the politics and the Tammany Hall because they were appointed, you know, it was a civic job, kind of a patronage, you know, almost job. And so, uh, also, you know, they were building the forces up from the get-go. So the, the New York police became professional, I, you know, paid around only the 1850s. So this is when the bulk of unemployed men, you know, were Irish. Um, you know, they they went through their phases, New York PD especially, you know, um, it was kind of hard to get a 24-hour force, for instance, you know, they, the badges. It wasn't necessarily a popular job at the very start. And then, you know, the so they're a little bit later joining, for instance, the fire department because they don't get paid until the 1860s as a volunteer. Um, so, but then it becomes almost family, I think. You know, your father might be up the ladder a bit and so he can bring in his son or a nephew or, you know. And so I can't remember, it's Marr, I think. Uh, Tim Marr has an amazing piece um, called loyalty like communal loyalty firemen on the stairs and he talks about exactly that like that irish people uh you know from the 19th century it was a communal culture and so their idea was of being of service you know if, if i get a good pensionable job even if it is you know as kind of a cop or a sanitation worker or a fireman so technically blue collar it's stable it means my son can have a job i can put my kid my daughter through you know teaching school um, and they're of service. And so, you know, it, it was a very interesting way of looking at it that instead of being stuck at that level, that they chose to be at that level because they lived with their communities. Now, you know, that changes a little bit in the 20th century. And we see particularly now when we're talking about reforming police, that they should live maybe in the cities they patrol because a lot of, you know, in the city, people live maybe in Long Island or, you know, Westchester County instead of the city. So that's an interesting, maybe there's a break between the community they police and the community they live in. But at the start, it was all the same, you know, so I think it was a kind of a natural um, way in for them. So, Next, can I, oh, sorry, can I jump ahead. in there for just a second? I, the only reason I'm jumping is my family is law enforcement. My father is was a police officer, now retired. My brother, one of my brothers is now his legacy in our town department. Uh, my grandfather before my father was what was called a peace officer because we didn't actually have a police department in the town at the time. But there's one irony about the kind of development of the police force in the United States, which did start in Boston and New York, where you had your first police forces. And the irony was when they first, they were kind of a volunteer force in communities where you, every grown man in the neighborhood had to put in a couple of hours every week. It was kind of a sort of volunteer position. You were just yeah. expected to do this. But when they actually started to make it a wage kind of, you know, solidified police force, it was in reaction to this quote unquote Irish problem. Yeah. So the police department actually was first formed to take care and control, you know, the Irish and then was overtaken by mm -hmm. the Irish mm -hmm. within, you know, uh, two generations. It's remarkable. It, you know, this institution that we see as having an Irish American stamp on it in almost every major city, at least in the Eastern Seaboard, was originally there to control and subdue the Irish. It, it's, and much, them. It, it's much argued how uh, valuable the word paddy, paddy wagon is. Yeah. <laughs> That they think it's the people who are driving it. There's others who think it's the people who are in it. In it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that is an interesting question. You know, I'm, I'm, I wonder about that stereotype of uh, the Irish and alcohol. Is that just a relic of uh, when the Irish were the poor people who were uh, arrested and it got associated with the, uh, with the ethnic identity or? there's not a there's not a reality to that is there well you know there is unfortunately a little bit of a reality um there's a lot of things going on i suppose you know some protestants for certain were more abstentions you know so there was a huge oh. temperance movement there was also a temperance movement in ireland though father matthew came over here and you know spoke during the 19th century so not every irish person drinks some um work has been done on actually the famine and the impact it has had kind of on the irish psyche but even on the genetics, you know, like that there was this long lasting depression and malnourishment and all these things that made people more susceptible to mental illness like depression and other things, which either could be compounded by or exacerbate, uh, you know, an alcohol problem. I would imagine, you know, particularly in the early 19th century, they're living in horrific conditions, you know, in five points. 
um, not that they necessarily drank to excess, but they drank publicly and women drank. So you could go to a groggery, you know, and, and partake. And as Jack said, the pub was where you went to hear the news. That's where you, you could get your letter read if you got a letter. It's where you found out about jobs. So it's not that it was all about drinking as such, but they, they visibly hang out like the Germans do on a Sunday, you know, at the beer garden with their kids. And so other... Um, other ethnic groups, or, or as I say, the Protestants did not do that, so it sets it up straight away as a, as a sort of a stereotype. But there is no doubt, you know, that um, there, there are problems with alcoholism, you know, in, in Irish and Irish Americans, um, which may or may not, you know, have, have started because of the famine kind of trauma or just general susceptibility. <laughs> St. Joseph's Parish, which is that beautiful building that's now not used on, uh, on Arbor Hill. Uh, had the largest uh, uh, temperance society in the United States of any parish, a thousand paid men. Yeah. Uh, and one reason is because a lot of them worked for Erastus Corning, who was a, a <laughs> prohibitionist type, who, who, who uh, took New York Central and, and built it as the temperance uh, railroad in the, in the country. They had all kinds of crashes and that type of thing. And and anybody, every man had to be a temperance man. A temperance didn't mean total abstinence, but you <laughs> had to you know, <laughs> a beer on the way home and so on. My, my father's uh, uh, family came from Arbor Hill. They lived next door to each other. And uh, John Horn worked, uh, for the, uh, uh, worked for the railroad. And whenever the girls were uh, having a beau come over a new person, he would take the boy into the parlor, close it, and sit him down and say, point to his lips, whiskey has never touched this, the, this mouth, right? <laughs> and then from there on, well, next door, there was a heavy drinking uh, fellow next door. That's who my grandmother married, and her older sister married the saloon keeper's <laughs> You know, so it didn't work too well. And when he died, he died <laughs> younger than the others. And the cause of death was, was stress. So <laughs> stress. <laughs> yes. And you hear lots of stories of immigrants, you know, that the father would say, don't have a drink until we can have one together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the kid leaves. And of course, they never come home. So the guy never drinks in America, you know, so <laughs> it, it is a small bit of a stereotype, yeah. you know, this because there was, you know, and huge movements in Ireland around temperance and the pioneer pin and all this. Oh but yeah, I think it was because they perform drinking in public, you know, um, in a in a temperate society. I, I remember when we had pioneers, and they tell you I'm a pioneer at the uh, ancient order of Hibernians, yeah. Yeah. and they they never broke it, and uh, they all had Father uh, Matthew's legacy, who mm -hmm. solved his own problems and really worked with hardworking people to get them into the temperance societies. Mm -hmm. I'm still struck by the notion that. Erastus Corning was a temperance guy when you consider that Mayor Erastus Corning ended up being a product of the uh, <laughs> brewer, uh, uh, Boss O'Connell. <laughs> so kind of uh, interesting, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, he was, he was uh, uh, Erastus Corning the first was uh, into temperance, into abolition. Uh, he ran the railroad. If you would go for uh, uh, bleeding Kansas and you had your family and there was land out there, you would get a free, you would, you would get funding from the Albany banks. You would get the tools from Albany uh, uh, hardware and arm, uh, hardware that he owned and also uh, a free ticket on his railroad to get him out there to vote for uh, free soil. Uh, nice. But he, Alcohol was another one. He was a, he was a do-gooder in a lot of ways. Uh huh. Well, as we begin to to wrap up, maybe Jennifer, I'll start this one with you to think about the contemporary uh, Irish American experience. You know, we've talked about uh, the pressures that uh, uh, confronted the new Irish uh, immigrants to this country, um, and the results of it. I wonder, are the um, since you go back and forth pretty frequently, mm -hmm. uh, are there issues that confront the contemporary uh, uh, Irish American community that are unique to that community? Or is, is everything, uh, have the Irish in America so 
um, become a part of this culture that you can't really say, well, there are particular issues that confront Irish Americans that don't confront, say, Italian Americans or uh, German Americans or something. Do you think there's anything unique to being Irish in America anymore? Well, absolutely. I mean, we, we have our emblems, we have our traditions, we have our, our kind of festivals and festivities that we do. Yes, absolutely. And we do keep them, but there is a, it's, I, I look back to when I was, you know, a kid back in the seventies and stuff, and it was a much more kind of solid identity than it is now, much more fluid now. Um, it's something that people can key into at, at different times when they want to, um, when it's advantageous for them and when it's not um, more American than they are Irish American. Um, and that's, I think, a very distinctive difference from what it was, um, where you, you kind of, kind of, hid at one point my ancestors had to hide their Irishness as much as they could which really was quite hard <laughs> <give them money. laughs> um, but no I mean I, I think that we're much like a lot of other immigrant groups um, one thing that I would say is um, I find and then this is not you know indicative of the entire group but we have this remarkable history as immigrants um, something that we take as a point of pride quite a bit of pride that we went from this this group that was our, our kind of collective idea of the um, immigrant experience at the beginning, they, they thought of themselves as exiles. And that changed over a period of time into a success story, We're kind of the American immigrant success story. And we forget a lot of times of what our ancestors had to go through, the early immigrants had to go through, the prejudice they faced, what they were actually fleeing. Um, they were coming out of the most inhospitable conditions that we could even conceive of. And we tend to forget that. And it's something that I think that um, in contemporary Irish America, I, I wish I saw more of, particularly given some of the issues that are going on, not just here in the United States, but I see it as well over in, in Europe um, with kind of the boat crisis there, our border crisis here. Um, maybe some more empathy, a more kind of a, a, a correlation between our own experience and what other people are going through now, because there are distinct correlations. Um, but that might be one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. I get in trouble for saying that with some of my Irish American friends, but it is true. And, and when I teach my classes, that's one thing that I think comes through with my students the most is they have this kind of perfunctory idea of what their ancestors experience was. They have nominal ideas about the famine for the most part, you know, some of them are very knowledgeable. Um, but when we kind of bring things into the contemporary scope and we start to talk about Irish American today, we look at some of the kind of immigrants that are coming into this country today and their experiences. And that's, I think one of the most alarming things with the students is they start to see the corollaries between the two. Um, they're starting to see some of those same kinds of discourses that we saw, you know, a hundred years ago or more, you're seeing circulating again today. Um, and sometimes the Irish are some of those that circulate those discourses and have historically. Um, and so that's something that I think is, is one of the most important thing. We have this rich, rich history um, to build off of that we could be employing to help other people to kind of foster understanding and more of a discourse of what it means to be an immigrant in this country um, and what these people actually do for this country, their contributions, both you know, socially, economically, but also culturally as well. Elizabeth, you want to uh, add yeah. on to that? Um, I, I, I agree with you, Jennifer. I think, you know, um, as someone who's running an Irish American Heritage Museum, I am concerned sometimes that maybe younger generations are not identifying necessarily as Irish American. You know, it's a more nebulous kind of, um, the connection is so far out that I, you know, I, I will say one of the things I'm optimistic about is, you know, the people are loving Irish dancing, you know, that sort of, so the culture of Irish America is still very thriving. And we do see children involved at, at that level or playing Irish music. But, you know, I would like them to Jennifer's point to engage with, you know, the museum's education program in terms of, you know, well, a becoming a member, but following the, the <laughs> presentations that we do, you know. And, and I think part of that too is that it is fragmented. Irish America is fragmented today. And as, you know, Jack alluded to it earlier on, his ancestors really were refugees, you know, fleeing a famine Ireland where there was plenty of food don't forget the food is being exported out you know uh, the potato crop failed um, and so I think that we don't now have this block like I'm sure Irish Catholic Americans every one of them had a picture of Kennedy in their house you know oh, yeah. with the Pope we don't have that Democrat <laughs> block today it's it's more fragmented you know so 
Um, and the other thing is we're still getting undocumented Irish workers in, which maybe a lot of Irish Americans don't realize. So, you know, undocumented uh, workers are not just coming from the southern border. They're landing in airplanes every day. 90% of illegal immigrants land in an airport, you know, so um, it, the border needs to be thought about differently, you know. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you, Jack. Uh, I think we'll uh, give you perhaps the last word here. What do you want to add to well, that? I think when we study any ethnic group, and this time we're looking at our own Irish group, I think when people look at what goes on, when they watch the movie uh, Roots, which everybody thought that would be a loser and so on, and they looked at a family uh, struggling, leaving a beloved land, being accepted poorly, going through struggle after struggle, and eventually conquering, and the family is still there, they see themselves. Now, they may have been the Italians fleeing the poverty of Sicily, might have been the Irish uh, starving at the, at the famine, etc. But they see themselves. And I just wish when people go and they go down to the Irish Museum and they're thinking of F. Scott Fitzgerald and Eugene O'Neill and, and Bill Kennedy, and they're thinking of Reagan and they're thinking of, of Kennedy, that they have to remember if they would look back, these were the people that filled the poor houses, sometimes even the jails, and really had a tough time and lasted in the case of the famine, an average person lived seven years after they arrived here. They were a problem. And we've produced some of the absolute best of American society. And if they realize that the people that are coming now also in other problems, they might not be exactly the same, but they can identify. They realize that America works, that they are we. We're the same people. And the genius of America takes people with problems, brings them in, gives them the best, the best of every society, and they can pick and choose on it. And what comes out at the end, you're still what you were when you walked in, but you can appreciate this unique society that we live in here in America. And these people cheapen themselves if they look at it too narrowly or without the perspective of how they got there. Well, thank you. This is, I, I wanna thank you three, uh, all, uh, because uh, I'll tell you, I moderate a lot of uh, panel discussions. I somehow, it's a, it's a not Facebook hashtag, I guess, I'm a newspaper editor. Uh, this has just been spectacular. So thank you, Elizabeth Stack, Jennifer Crowley, Jack McEnany, and thanks to you, our audience, for joining us for this Albany for Music, a special event, Celtic Dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yes, yes. Happy St. Patrick's, Day. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Thank you for joining Albany Pre Musica for this special discussion. I hope you have enjoyed the illuminating commentary of our guests. Albany Pre Musica is so pleased to offer community engagement opportunities like this one as part of our virtual 40th anniversary season. During these unprecedented times, the support of our patrons and donors is more important than ever. Please consider making a contribution today. Thank you.